Hi, this is Kate Elliott, and I'm here with Narrative World Season 3, and today my guest is Susan Dennard, and I'm delighted to have Suze here today. She's already told me she has no filter, so this is going to be really interesting, isn't it? Um, Susan has written the New York Times best, is, is the New York Times bestselling author, I'm reading from something now, so if my face looks funny, that's fine. <laughs> Is a New York Times bestselling author of the Witchland series, which I love, um, and the Something Strange and Deadly series, and the and her new series, The Luminaries. Um, do you want to add anything to that? I guess I should hold up a cover. I did like grab a copy. Oh, good. This is The Luminaries, guys. It came out last November. That's the Barnes and Noble edition, but yeah, it's pretty. It's a beautiful edition, and it's a great cover. Thank I you. Really I appreciate great covers. Um, so you are not a failure. And I don't mean you, I mean you, you, anybody who's listening with us today. Oh, hold on, hold on. Since this is informal, by the way, those of you who are with us in the live, I won't be checking chat. If you have a question or an angle that you'd like us to approach, please put it in the Q&A. Ooh. And we will check those later, later in the thing. And I also want to thank Nathan Lucas, who, as usual, is the tech guy today. Um, so I want to just start with why this topic now, since this series has mostly dealt with world building and with craft of writing issues. But this year, this season, I wanted to kind of move into things that are about writing process and about the, the things that people struggle with as writers, um, both with career and then just these internal things. And this topic really comes from your newsletter. So can you briefly talk a little bit about your newsletter, which I subscribe to because you have been running it for years. Many years, yes. Yeah. Um, Yes, so I started blog blogging back when that was the thing, uh, many in 2009, uh, and just sort of writing about my journey as I sought to become a published author and everything that I was learning along the way with a very honest lens, which I guess was not that common back then. Mm -hmm. I think it's a lot more common now, but back then um, there there wasn't a whole lot of transparency, and I think as I just said, I have no filter. So I am very comfortable about sharing everything that makes me uh, a failure. Essentially, I have no, I have no shame. I'm not going to be embarrassed by the fact that I stumbled a lot and I'm still stumbling a lot. Uh, and I think that makes my newsletter unique because, uh, mm -hmm. it, and I knew, I know it did then back when I first actually made it a newsletter in 2014. Um, because more and more people kept subscribing and passing along my information. And now of course, I have, I've moved over to Substack. So I do um, still one to two free newsletters a month, which is the same content I've always done. And then I also do a lot like two every week for paid subscribers where I answer specific questions about the pains of writing and publishing. Mostly people ask about the pains and I have no problem sharing my experiences and insights uh, about the pains. And then if I don't know, I go and I ask someone like my agent who can give me information. Uh, and I think I think, yeah, that the fact that I was so comfortable being uncomfortable made made people uh, subscribe and want to learn more. Uh, it really annoys me when people say that, like, there's just no no information out there. I'm like, well, you're not looking. OK, I, I can find information even when I don't know mm -hmm. something um, mm -hmm. on the Internet. And I myself, of course, have been providing it for such a long time. And uh, I'm pretty happy. We ha I have. Um, 14,000 subscribers. So it's, and it's growing. That's been a nice thing about Substack is that it, that nice algorithm over there helps it grow and find new yeah. people. So if you all are watching, please come join the community. I love everybody. And you know, that's, and that's why I subscribed back. I don't know. So I it must be five or six, seven. Well, yeah. pro actually probably after we met, probably, we met in yeah. person in 2015. Um, at, wow. com at Comic Con. At, at Comic Con, yeah. We're, yeah. we're yeah. old now. We're old now. Um, yeah. And so, but, and, and I remember what struck me about the newsletter was that I was like, I'm very reserved. I'm an introvert. I'm also a social introvert. I love people, but I'm very reserved. And I'm like, I'm just not going to like crack no. anything open. No, it's not happening. Right. <laughs> um, not because I think it's wrong, just because it's my personality. So when I see something like that, I'm like, 
oh, I, it's just like, I grab for it because oh, I you. like, if I had that capacity to be more out there, I would. Um, so I appreciate it when it's there because I think it matters so much because I feel like so many of us are like swimming through these murky waters and we think we're alone. We're the only person who's ever dealt with this and all those other people, they're fine because we see them on social media or we see their blog post or we see them on a panel and they just look fine. They have that nice face and they look good and you know, their makeup's good or whatever. They have nice glasses. I don't know, you know, and everything we see is this this what they're showing out yeah. because we live in a society where we kind of have to do that but that knowledge that for me the knowledge that I'm not alone that right. I'm not the only person this happens to helps make it better um so so you sent out last year I don't remember when right at a time when it mattered to me to see that headline you are not a failure and I'm like oh, I'm not a failure thank goodness <laughs> I dive down that abyss all too often. And can you talk a little, you were answering a query from a reader. Yes, it was one of the questions readers give me. I do regular AMAs and then I basically make posts about every question. Um, and I, I would have to look up what they asked, but I get asked that sort of general question a lot. Like, why can't I do this? Why, why aren't the gatekeepers letting me through? Um, how do I find the motivation to keep going? And so I really dove into that whole idea of like, you are not a failure and this industry is out of our control and it is hard. It is so hard. And um, it's, it's one of those things too, where I, no matter how successful you are, there is that sense of being out of control. Um, and yeah. it just comes yeah. with different problems. Yeah. I have friends from all spectrum, you know, part of the spectrum, they're very uber successful with the, with the popular TV series and the ones who can't sell again. Um, and we've all been there. And so, well, I haven't had a TV show, but maybe one day. <laughs> um, and we can all hope, right? We can all hope, right? <laughs> and uh, so it's interesting to see how the challenge is always the same of, I can't make this go the way that I want it to go. And that feeling of helplessness is awful. It is awful. And um, it is impossible not to turn around and blame that on ourselves. Um, and I, yeah. so I try to, I try to talk about that, whatever stage people are, are stuck in and feeling um, like they can't overcome and get work through. I, that is the very, whatever topic I will talk about it. Yeah. Cause I've been it, I've been it at all. So I know how it's, it, it's so interesting to me, like you say that, it, and I want to like, oh, there's so much here um, <laughs> that, that this sense that there's things, there's so much in the publishing industry that's out of our control. Yes. And yet, why is it? I mean, I don't have an answer for this. Why is it we blame ourselves? Is that because it's in our control to blame ourselves? If I can't blame something else, it must be me. Is it partly because the industry likes to say, well, you, you didn't because they also don't know, right? I think, they I think that's part of it, right? Because we bear the consequences, even if it's not our fault. At the end yeah. of the day, if my sales are poor, I'm the one who can't sell again. Uh, or at the end of the day, even if my book is amazing, if it's not what the industry wants right now, I'm not making it off this out of the slush pile. Uh, and so even though it has nothing to do with how hard I worked or how great the product is that I'm putting out there, I still bear those consequences. So it's very hard to separate that and not turn it, it around and blame myself. My books must suck. Uh, my publisher must hate me. Readers must hate me. I must be terrible at this. Why do I even try? And I, it sounds dramatic, but I know those are the actual thoughts that we all have. You know, it strikes me too that it's almost, it's almost more reassuring to say, well, I just suck. That's why it didn't go well. Than it is to say the timing was off or it wasn't the thing that was going this year, or maybe I won't ever, you know, get a TV deal because that's just how it roles it's yeah. almost easier in a way it's almost more it's it's, it's like a, it's if I can blame myself then it's like well at least I have a reason at least yeah, it's not just exactly. blind chance right or or you know fate that is just like 
too bad you got left out of that boat, you know. It's so interesting you say that because we were talking before we started this that um, I had done, I've been in therapy um, because of something that happened to me during childbirth. And I had some, a while of therapy after that. And um, one of the things my therapist kept saying to me was like, Susan, there's not always going to be a reason. You have yeah. to accept that you can't always find a reason. And even still, I'm like, yeah, there is. I may not learn yeah. what it is, yeah. but there is yeah. a reason. And um, I, I think yeah. you're right. That's exactly it. Like we need something to blame because we have to explain it to ourselves. It is the human condition that we need to have an explanation for why things are the way that they are. And so if I can point to me and be like, the problem must be me. Uh, that's an easy, you're right. It's an easy, an easy scapegoat. It's better than, it's almost better than, than nothing, right? Yeah. Than not having an answer. Like, okay, the agent never replied to me. I will never know. Did they want my manuscript or, okay, my sales have plateaued completely. Why does nobody want this book? Must be my fault. Yeah. What would we, um, something that you said in, one of the things you said, I, I actually went back and reread the, um, that, that newsletter. Yeah. I just brought it up so I could look at it too. Cause I was like, right. Um, and <laughs> so one of the things, well, actually there's two things I want to deal with. One is like how we deal with it, but I want to continue a little bit more with this idea that sometimes I'm asked, or I see the question, well, all this self-doubt gets better, right? You know, after you've been writing for several decades, you, you, you've written some books, it gets better, right? You stop doubting yourself. And I'm always sorry to have to say that. <laughs> no, 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 no. Uh, you really, it, it really doesn't get better. And I, like I said, even if you're the most successful, I see my good friends with everything, as far as I'm concerned, still face that same imposter syndrome, the same terror, it's all going to go away. Uh, because it's just not a certain industry. Um, there just really aren't any guarantees, unfortunately. And, um, you know, we all want to be the next big thing, but the big things don't always last. Only a few people have held the top spots forever. So it's hard and scary. <laughs> and I just, there's not really an answer. I mean, there is in that I can give people the tools that I've developed, like learned and used to make myself feel better. Um, but, but at the end of the day, you have to find certainty in yourself. And if you can't, then that, then it is always going to be a struggle. And it's not that easy, right? It's not like I'm suddenly like, oh yes, I've just found certainty and I feel good all the yeah, time. I feel good about it. Yeah. No, it is a constant fight of like, ah, these are not the way I want my thoughts to be going. Must use what I've learned in therapy to direct them another way. To reframe the old reframing thing. Yeah. Because I, I still deal with that. Uh, well, I always, as a writer, there was, I had that almost a pattern with many of my books, not all of them, in which I would start out with writing with a great deal of enthusiasm. And then I would hit the middle and all of a sudden I would hit that chasm of doubt. It's like, this book is no good. I've lost it. I've lost it. And then someone would say to me, my kids would say, that's what you said last book, mom. And I go, yes, but this time, this now time it's different. This time I, I've really lost it. And then all of a sudden I would pick it back up again and be able to finish it. Yeah. Um, so part of it is understanding that there's that artistic temperament, that fear that we're going to, we, we're not going to accomplish what we want because why are we artists at all? We're trying to accomplish something that's actually pretty amazing. Be wild. I know, I know. Um, Maggie Stiefvater calls it translating. You have this amazing idea and story in your head and we're just translating it onto the page and how yeah. close how the translation will never be perfect. Yeah. And our job is just to get it as close to that perfect in our head as we can. And I struggle with that. Let me tell you, the translation part is the hardest part for me. I am not good. Drafting is not my favorite part of the process. No, no same, same. So um, I, I literally hit that point today. I was walking my dogs and I was like, I am at a, this book is horrible. Why am I even pretending that this is any good? Like it's, <laughs> All the fans of the series of the Witchland series are going to be so disappointed. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, I have gotten much better at being able to like be like, all right, you're doing that again. Um, 
and it doesn't matter because it's like in in this situation I am contracted so I will finish this book because I have to get paid and I don't want them to like sue me or anything so I I have a deadline to get me going through that um but then there are all the projects we haven't yet sold you know that we hit mm -hmm. that point of like is it even worth doing this what if no one buys it what if no editor wants it no no she's tough right now <laughs> it it is and the the, the other the other thing about that is especially with social media and people coming up now as writers i mean it was so much different when i started because there was no social media so what you saw about writers lives was almost nothing yeah it was just something that happened in this mysterious space that yeah. we never saw you might see an interview in a newspaper now and again with someone but you had to either it was either a local paper doing you know local person yeah. makes good or it was a national newspaper which meant it was stephen king right or daniel Steele. so between those two things there wasn't really anything about what it was like to be a writer but now we sit those of us who are on social media um we sit and what we see on social media is this face or even a facade and it's it's intimidating you know so someone someone may say oh i got a great i got a new deal for my book you know i i sold a book this is great and you think wow they're on a roll but yeah. we don't know maybe there was another book that got we don't know anything no. we don't know anything about what else maybe it's going great for them but maybe they've had like two years of hell right exactly exactly um i mean that's i think about that a lot um because it's not the same, but it is in the sense that I had such a difficult time getting pregnant and then giving birth. And like, this isn't something I was, I mean, I actually was very vocal about it online. Um, and the number of people who came forward and then saying yeah. like, I too had to go through all of these fertility treatments and I too had miscarriage and loss. Um, and then I too had this traumatic birth scenario. And um, it is amazing how many people come out when you are able to yeah. be honest and talk about that online but i also understand the instinct to not want to talk about it uh it is it is not comfortable for everyone to do that and i totally support people sticking with their own comfort levels online i clearly again have no filter um but i also take great comfort in the people who then reach out to me so i guess it's sort of selfish yeah. lack of filter yeah. i am doing this to make a connection with other people who know how i feel so that I too feel less alone. Um, yeah. It is a very strange industry <laughs> and it doesn't work like any other industry. And trying to explain it to people who are not in the industry can be very difficult and they do not understand the challenges. And so it is really important to find people who get what you, we are all going through that you can talk to. Um, and I, yeah, but the internet is a highlight reel for the most part. So, you know, it's, it's just, it's hard not to compare yourself when you're on there. Um, and I know that like, I have had a lot of success. So it is ridiculous for me at times to then compare myself to the people who've had uber success and be like, oh, I want that. I'm not good enough. Why am I not having that? And then I remember, oh yes, but then here's my friend over here who hasn't been able to sell a book in two years and that is a very different experience and so I should be very grateful that I have you know a book deal and books coming out right now there's no guarantee that that will last um, well the other thing is is how are we even defining success it's and true. the U.S. It's the true. U.S. is particularly terrible this is this winners take all society you know you're either a superstar or you're no one right yeah. but and and I've gone through this because I'm in that state I'm waiting to hear back from a a book I wrote on spec, which for those who don't know, means I wrote the whole book. I didn't sell it on proposal. I wrote the whole book. I'm waiting to hear back. I've been writing for 30 years. I have 30 yeah. published novels. I'm like, you know, I I, I think there's a, I, I have reason to believe that it's going to sell the duology, but, but I don't, but I don't have a signed contract yet. You don't have the money. I'm vulnerable. I'm vulnerable. I'm not on the New York Times bestseller list. I'm not, you know, I don't have a TV deal. I don't have those things that make me a shoe in. So no. here I sit thinking to myself, and this is probably what I was thinking when your email, when your newsletter came, I was thinking like, what a failure I am. And then, and then you have to stop. 
you know, I had a really last spring was really rough for me. I was the most demoralized I'd probably mm -hmm. been in my entire career. And I've, I've made a couple of really stupid decisions and I've had a couple of unpleasant things happen to me previously. But I have to say, I was like at that point where I thought, why am I even doing this? Yeah. What's the point? Why, you know, nothing has worked out. I'm not going to, why, why even? And um, I ended up speaking of things you can do, and I'll, I'll get to the reframing thing in a minute, because this is why I write novels with 10 points of view and where they all go <laughs> anyway, they're long, because um, it's how my brain works. Um, I had to write the third book of a trilogy. And every time I looked at the third book, which I hadn't started, I would flinch emotionally. Yes. Just, and you can't write under those circumstances. You can't do it. Okay. And yet, and that's when I thought maybe it's over for me. Maybe I'm done. Meanwhile, I, you know, every writer I know has other stuff going on. They have that little percolating idea. Maybe it's going to turn into something, maybe not something that they have 5,000, 10,000 words written on that they set aside, whatever. So I had this little thing that I'd been writing kind of off and on on the side. And all of a sudden, I just decided this feels like it's alive. Let me just work on that because I'm not getting anything done on yeah. this other thing. Yeah. And I can, and I, so I committed to just work on that for a month, right? Just see if I can get stuff going. In once I let go of the sense that that other book was so much too much of a struggle for me to start, I wrote 240,000 words in six months. Wow. Nice. I know. It was just like, it was like on something that might never sell. It wasn't under contract. I didn't know, right? And when I got to the end, and I thought to myself, this book might never sell, but I enjoyed writing it. And if it never sells, if it's not, it might sell. It might be like super successful. It's a romantic fantasy. So it's like, you know, the, but, but then I had to stop myself and say, don't like, don't trap yourself with the ideas of what makes this successful. Yeah. What yeah. makes this successful is that I wrote two, this, this duology in six months and I enjoyed writing it. And it was a pleasure to me to write and I finished it. Yes. And then I was able to start that third book. It was like that I needed that just to get that out. Yeah. And I thought a lot about how important reframing success is. Yeah. So you're six you're successful. You have published one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Ten novels are out. Eleven comes novels. out this year. My eleventh goes out this year. Yes. By every measure, that is success, right? Except that measure that tells us that we didn't just get that eight-figure deal for. 12 books with and the TV show, right? Yeah. And it's one of my best friends. So yeah. 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 And good for her. Good for yeah. her. Um, right? Yeah. So I, I uh, we're talking about Lee Bardugo. Yes. Um, she yeah. was one yeah. of my best friends and um, I, bless her. She's not online right now. Good for her. She should not good be with her. The, good for her. And the TV yeah. show. Speaking of the pressures of success. I mean, there's a whole different yeah. slew of problems that yeah. come with yeah. it. And the fear of failure is in a totally different scale. It's just different. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, I, uh, it's interesting you say all that because I had a similar experience, um, with, I, I, I've struggled with the witch lands because I, because even though they are, let's be honest, adult fantasy, they've been published as YA. And so I'm, I've been stuck on the book of year timeline, which I've really struggled with, with that yeah. series. It is yeah. high fantasy. It is complex. There are so many point of view characters and it's a big series. And so I finally, during all of my terrible uh, situation with the birth and everything, I I had to slow down, and I I so there was a two year gap between books, which really hurt me from a sales perspective. And man, like I love my publisher; they are fantastic. But at the end of the day, it's a business, and they don't forget that stuff. It's it's an unfortunate reality. Yeah. Um, but I I gave birth, and it was very very 
bad. I nearly died and I was in the hospital for a long time. And um, I came home and all I thought about was how my book was due. And I, I, all I did for three months after my, with my newborn, when I physically could not, like I couldn't walk, I was in physical therapy. Um, and yet all I thought about and stressed about was my book and getting it finished for my publisher. Um, and I gave myself shingles and, wow. uh, that the shingles three months after my daughter was like three months in a week, uh, was the sign where I was like, you need to stop. <laughs> like no book is worth this. And wouldn't you think like near death would have given me that perspective, but no, apparently <laughs> not. Apparently I had to then give myself shingles and all that. Um, and since then I have like really tried to change my perspective on success and what that means. Um, because like, it's just a book. Like that's one of the things we have to remember too. It, we put so much pressure on it and I understand that deeply because my identity yeah, yeah. it's not just that I my identity is my job my identity is my writing I yeah. am my most I am the most Susan when I am in a in a story like that there is no even as a mother whom I love my daughter being a mom is the greatest thing true Susan is when she's in that book and so I understand the pressure that we put on each story and how much we love them and we want them to succeed and for everyone to love them but we also have to remember at the end of the day, it's a book. It's not a nuclear warhead. We aren't curing cancer, we're writing books. And so for me to like literally wreck my health for the sake of a book is just bonkers. It's just bananas. Like what, yeah. what yeah. was I thinking? But I am not the only person to do this. I hear stories like this all the time from my fellow authors and it is horrifying. Um, and then I see, I have plenty of friends who are still in the aspiring author stage and I see the pressure and um cruelty that they place upon themselves and yes and yeah. it's, it's because they don't have a book deal they can't get an agent to buy um and it's just not worth it's not like you said the success you wrote a book or many books <laughs> like isn't that incredible and the cool thing too today um is that there are other ways to publish there are yeah. more and more ways getting yeah. showing up it is not the world that it used to be so yeah yeah I have, I have I, why why are we so hard on ourselves I there's no I don't know is there an answer they may not be I mean I don't know and I do I do think um I do think this is going to sound bad and I don't want it to but I do think publishers benefit from us being this way um I think uh, yeah I, I think there's a benefit to them when we are so afraid of losing our our book deal, our spot yeah. their, on their marketing yeah. roster, our place in the season. Um, it, it is a fraught place to be. And it, I, it pits us against each other, frankly, because it is a limited pie. Um, and I think that publishers benefit from that. I don't know. I don't mean that they are actively malicious, but the byproduct doesn't harm them. It only harms us. So yeah, I, I, Maybe I'm being too transparent and honest now. No, but... no, 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 because people don't hear this enough. The reality for, for me is that I, I was so ignorant for so long, but partly because it just was really hard to get information yeah. when I started out, you know, that, and, and it's amazing to be how slowly I have learned fit lessons like this, which is, you know, in my early days, I was dropped by a publisher my first trilogy was dropped before the second two books came out although they they didn't come out but they did come out but they were but I was they were I was told you know that was like my my first entry into the thing was that I sold a trilogy and the first book came out and six weeks later even though it had gone to a second printing they're like well we're not going to buy anything more from you ever right that was my that's like my opening salvo and that's and, what happened with me too my first trilogy yeah. it's out of print now it's out of print I am like, it's a horrible, it's horrible to be dumped in and fail. Well, I, well, I'm so grateful for eBooks, right? Because all of my backlist is in eBook now oh, it's, it's out of print, but, but people can get it. And before that they were just gone. You had to, you would have to search true. for them in a it's used true. bookstore. Yeah, it's true. I but remember. at least people can read them still because of technology, which 
I'm like super grateful for and the trickle of royalties I get is help is important for me. Yeah. Um, <laughs> oh, we did it. Um, you, you also say in that newsletter, the circumstances within which we tried to succeed weren't favorable to us. And that's um, something that hits home a lot with me because sometimes we bring out a book and it's two years too early or two years too late. Sometimes we're, I'm, I'm next month's narrative world, I'm having Melinda Low back. So she was on, I know Melinda, I've known Melinda for a while and she was on two years ago, we talked about research. Yeah. In the interim between that day and this day, she won the National Book Award. And her career was very small, very modest. And now she's Melinda Lowe, National Book Award winner. So we never know what's going to happen. We never, like you said, you can be top of the world and then, then you can't sell a book and you can be running along with your modest career, clinging to the edge of the cliff, you know, that I often feel like I'm clinging to the edge of the cliff and I'm ready to drop off. Are the roots of that plant going to come out, you know, sending me plunging? Um, but, but we just don't know. And we do have, people have more options now than they had before. Yeah. Well, there's more options now. And I, I mean, like on that note, so my first series was steampunk and I was able to sell pretty quickly because publishers were like, steampunk is going to be a thing. Steampunk did not become a thing. And my series did terribly. Um, and, mm -hmm. and I couldn't sell again and the Susan Dennard name was dead before it even came out uh and actually the only thing that allowed me to sell again was my newsletter because I developed such a big following there um and that was the other thing that I was so open and honest about was like hey guys immediately took off that cliff and fell you know I'm Wiley Coyote yeah. and I was yeah. honest about all of that and how much it hurt um without because with it, it does hurt it does uh, hurt and hurt. that's something that it's I, I think it's important to say that it's okay to say, wow, this really hurt. This rejection or this, 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 you know, these low sales, it it hurts. It does hurt. Rather than saying, well, I've just got to be above all that. Well, or I mean, you know, I think what happens, the natural instinct is to then get very bitter and blame your publisher. I see it happen every new year. There's a debut group, the same thing. Um, because you don't, we're so ignorant when we go into this industry, all of us, we're so ignorant. I don't care like how much I put out there. Like it is so hard. It's like becoming a parent. You literally cannot understand it until you are in it. And yeah. so you think you're educated and you know what's coming in the publishing world, but I, I see it with friends who work in publishing and then they're like, oh, now I'm an author. It's very different. I knew all the steps and I'm still unhappy. And, uh, it is, it is very easy to fall into a bitter place. And I myself went into a bitter place of being very angry. My book didn't do well, but other people's were doing well. Somehow it was my publisher's fault because they didn't push me enough. Why? And this is what I hear constantly. Why do they push one or two titles and not everybody? Um, and the reality is like the thing that brought me the most Zen and that I still preach is that you have to accept it's a business. We are, yeah. it's, it's not just, it's a business, yeah. it's a speculative business. They buy up a bunch of books, speculating. One of them's going to do well. When they see the one they think is going to do well, that's where they put the money. That's how it works. It yeah. sucks when you're not that one. And it even sucks when you are that one sometimes, but you know what? That's how it works. And so you have to accept it. If you're ever going to make peace with it and learn to stop blaming ourselves for it, um, there's a there's a writing coach I really like who always says Loki runs the industry. Like you, you got no <laughs> Loki. Well, Loki's in charge. Yes, yes, yeah. So yeah. Um, yeah. her name's Becca Syme too. I feel like I should give her a plug for that because it's true. And I always remember that. Like Loki's in charge, Suze. I mean, it's amazing that you know your book got picked by Target. I've never been picked by Target, by the way. I'm just, I'm just spitballing. Right, right, right. I, I hear you. It's amazing yeah. if your book gets in Target, but like, yeah. I can't make that happen. And it doesn't mean my book was any worse than my friends who is in Target. Um, but that the fact that that person is in Target means that they have more opportunities to sell and continue their career so that 
success continues to feed success and it sucks but that's how it works and um and and i yes we would all like it to change i keep hoping for change i thought covid would be the thing to force us to change but it hasn't happened yet and if you can't accept that then it's really hard to not be bitter in this industry um and i i really wish there was a lot less bitterness i well well the other thing about bitterness is bitterness never ever helps a person create I, I guess there might be a case where someone spite writes a book right we all we've all heard about something where like yes, I'm gonna show like that. that I'm yeah. gonna show that jerk and write you know I'm gonna kill my you know <laughs> whatever in in the book or something so so sure there's very rare cases but in general as a as a um okay I'm gonna tell I'm gonna tell it a personal story this is very rare for me and only you could have brought it out right so after 30 years of marriage my ex left the marriage so this was and and frankly in retrospect it was the best thing right yeah. but it was a long protracted process part of which which was very incredibly unpleasant debil horrible it was horrible um I was, I'm sure I was depressed for several years and the writing was really rocky during that time and all of that stuff. So, so he left and, um, and I, I went to, to counseling, of course, because I needed some way to kind of process it and yeah. things seemed to be getting better, but there was still just a few things. And I was talking to the counselor about, well, I thought that, you know, I was going to be married and we were going to like be old together and go like on a moped around Crete and, you know, do this and all this and that. And, and, you know, and, and I was talking and she looks at me and she said, you need to let go yeah. of the resentment. And it just like, bam. And I thought, oh, I'm holding on to something that's yeah. stopping me from moving forward. And I think bitterness in writing stops you from moving forward to say, well, I could write a romantic fantasy duology in six months just because I wanted to. And then something may come of that, but it doesn't matter. But because, but if all I did was dwell on the bitterness, yeah. you just keep running up against that wall just keep running up against the wall and you don't heal because you don't acknowledge that you're yeah. hurting you would turn yeah. it into bitterness instead of acknowledging that like wow that hurt i have to grieve that i have to grieve the fact that i thought my career was going to look like this and didn't yeah. yes and, and yeah. it never will it never will it might one day go that way but i can't go back and make the first series that that failed uh succeed yeah. <laughs> I yeah. can't change that. And I, I always say that the greatest thing that happened to me was to have my first series fail because it taught me hard lessons right out of the gate yeah, that same. I, I don't regret learning, um, that I think have made me a better person, a happier person, a better writer. Um, and I take nothing for granted, <laughs> you know? Um, and if I do catch myself taking something for granted, then it's like, girl, you remember where you were? Okay. Uh, and so no, but then I'm just saying because my first that first trilogy had this uh, similar experience. What I remember from those days is, of course, it was crushing. Yeah, and it was painful. Yeah. But there was a part of me that said, "Fuck this! I'm going to write something else." Right, and that gave me a kind of a toughness that I knew I could keep going. And that has, you know, I've been writing a long time. I'm not a New York Times bestseller. I haven't had like a big award winning this or whatever. I've just slogged along You've in had a career. Yeah, I have had a career. I'm still and that's the reframing thing. It's like, well, I haven't had any of these obvious markers of success, but I'm still here. You're still here. That is huge. I'm still here. And yeah. that that even I just want people to know you don't have to have these obvious gold stars of success to be to have a to be a writer. Well, right? and then the thing too that we forget, it's like, okay, my books have hit the New York Times list. That means I I had good sales for one week. <laughs> you know? <laughs> like right. you have to remember yeah. Yeah. it doesn't mean my book is still selling very well. It doesn't mean that my publisher like it doesn't guarantee anything actually, especially now. So like um, you know, publishers are still going to happily use your sales against you, even if you're a New York Times bestseller. 
they there there isn't actually much of a change except that you get a nice little title on your book which is cool but it doesn't it doesn't suddenly open doors i'm not suddenly happier my teeth aren't whiter i don't have any Wait, what <laughs> in my life <laughs> oh, my illusions shattered i yes. you know i was i met i probably i think at that same 2015 comic con i met someone who's um who to me their their debut trilogy had come out it had been on the times list for some amount maybe not a lot of time but a little bit I remembered it I had it had been visible enough that I had noticed it and I was on a panel we chatted she was lovely and I made some comment and she said and, and she'd gotten I think a a big deal for yeah, 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 yeah. for the debut and she said yeah my publisher was really disappointed and I was like right yeah that's the thing though right there so so she is so it was like that success was then in in an imbalance there so she was just just her expression when she said that she was carrying that disappointment yeah. with her yeah. to her next project i mean you I know always, i always say it feels kind of like parents that i'm trying to impress that like, I'm like, please, please just love me and my sales numbers, please keep me, please don't ditch me and throw me out onto the streets. But that's really what it feels like a lot of the time. It's like, you're just like praying. Yeah. That, and it's, I always also have to emphasize, it's not the individuals. It is never the individuals on your team. It is the way the corporations run. It's a corporate structure. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, I love my team. They're amazing. I know that they would keep everyone if they could. But at the end of the day, there are these profit and loss statements that they have to look at. And then they have to say as a business and a corporation, sorry, we can't offer you any money for your next books. Um, we just don't see where they're going to fit in our list. And uh, it's this it's it's impossible, I think. I mean, it's almost impossible anyway for us to separate that and not take it personally and not feel yeah. like we're being rejected by our parents or whatever figure you want to place in there. It, it, but it is a rejection and it hurts and it's hard. Um, if it's the market rejecting you because no one buys your books, that's hard. If it's an editor rejecting you, an agent rejecting you, it doesn't matter. A reader rejecting you and a review, I got plenty of those. It is hard. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, um, I, I'm right now. My book, my first book, just came out in France like a month ago, which I'm very excited because my husband is French and finally his family can read it. And um, I'm getting tagged in all those reviews, and I'm like, "You guys, I read French. I get what you're selling. You know, please don't tag me in these. Come on, why would you do that?" Uh, but people do, and so the constant rejection. Yeah, yeah. constant. You know, and and that that makes me think about something about transparency. To come back to that, I think one of the things that happens is our fear that if people knew the truth, right? If they knew the truth about the bad reviews we got, or our sales numbers, or the fact that you know this book got rejected, but then another one got accepted, whatever, right? That they yes. would judge us harshly, and and that that fear of judgment is part of what I think makes people both feel like they're a failure because it could happen, but also not want to not want to reach out to, to other people and say, oh, this happened to me, too, or or just to say this happened to me. And, and this is something that happens in the field. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it does. And I I mean, one of the first emotions that humans evolved was shame because to be rejected yeah. from the tribal group was to die. And so you had yeah. to yeah. evolve the emotion of shame. It is the deepest emotion that we can feel, which is horrible when you think about it. Thanks, yeah. evolution. And so it, it is It is exactly that, though, that gets hit when you get rejected in any way, shape, or form throughout the process of this industry. Um, you feel shame. And shame is a horrible feeling. And that is why I think if you can learn to grieve it and face that shame and accept that you're feeling it and it hurts. Yeah. yeah. This is turning around and blaming Loki. Well, you can blame Loki, blame Loki versus your publisher or a bookstore or readers who don't get it, something like that. And it's much healthier and you will, you will possibly survive longer in the industry. If you can instead turn to it and say, wow, that hurt. And I'm in pain and I need to grieve this. Um, and then hopefully I can work through that and eventually, if not move on, at least take on that texture to my life and continue to write. Because yeah, bitterness, I think can, unless it's like a vengeful bitterness, I think it yeah. can be down, yeah. 
We've got a couple of great questions here. Um, Les Leslie just has a comment. When we, when we were talking about numbers of books people have written, <laughs> um, Leslie says, Tolkien only published, what, six books? Yeah, but Tolkien. <laughs> I mean, yeah, Tolkien, I mean, an icon, the 20th century icon, you know, you absolutely. can't predict that. You can't yeah. aspire to that. No. He, he wasn't, see, he wasn't, when Tolkien wrote the, that whole thing that he wrote, he wasn't thinking, I'm going to become a 20th century icon. I don't think he was. I think he just wrote deep, but it's true. You don't need a lot of books. You need one book. You need, what, To Kill a Mockingbird, which... Yeah. is not so beloved now in the 21st century, but in the 20th century was considered, a, you know, one of the important works of American literature. Priya says, so uh, Priya and Eric, and these are kind of related questions um, in there. So, so Priya asks, do you have any strategies for when writer's doubt is stronger than usual most days? My strategy tends to be talk it out or cheer on other people or bake. I'm here for baking. <laughs> I mean, my, I think talking to other people is really good if you have friends that you, or family that will listen to you and can understand. And if that helps you, then by all means do that. I talk about in that newsletter, one of the tips that I learned in therapy, um, because I was diagnosed with OCD. And so one of the main mechanisms is a behavioral therapy that they teach you, um, because one of the main elements of OCD are very horrible intrusive thoughts and so the way that mm. I learned to remap map my brain because that's essentially what you're doing right so if you think of your brain as a bunch of um, neural pathways the more you use the neural pathways the faster the thoughts slide down them because the synapses develop a thicker myelin sheath sorry I have a background in stem I'm getting just a little bit specific here but no 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 it's good because I'm I'm, I'm feeling all this okay I'm so you're right strong um, myelin sheaths that go around the synapses and that <clears throat> the more you use those neural pathways, the, the thicker it gets and the faster the thought is able to flow. So when someone has OCD or really any sort of intrusive thoughts or anxiety, you're literally just improving and or worsening it because you let the thoughts keep happening and they keep moving and it gets stronger and stronger and stronger. Yeah, so when yeah, yeah, you have yeah. something like these doubts, um, and they, you let them go and they just keep getting stronger and stronger and stronger and going down that same pathway. Um, what I learned in therapy is that I have to actually take that thought and then write it all the way to the what if conclusion, oh. dark, dark, what if conclusion, yeah. what happens when I get all the way to the end and you just keep doing that. You keep doing it and you keep doing it. And what happens is the more that you do it, it actually takes away one, a lot of the power of the thought because very rarely do I reach the end of the thought and I'm dead. <laughs> like usually there is something horrible, but I'm alive at the end of it. And it's not nearly as bad as I think it's going to be. The what if with no answer is so much more yeah. uh, frightening for our brain than to actually write it to the conclusion. So what if I can't sell another book? What happens? And, and I have a page in my bullet journal in which I began listing. What can I do? I could self-publish. I could put something up on Wattpad I could, or Radish. I could, you know, and, and like, I just had to start doing that to stop myself from cycling, right? That's, that's, the, that's a great thing to do. To write it down is perfect um, because you do write it out. You write it out. Like, what's the worst that can happen? They, my sales aren't good. My publisher doesn't want another one. Okay, would I stop writing? Maybe for a while, but not forever. I am incapable of not writing. I love it too much. It would come back to me. And so yeah. then what would I do? Like you said, I have a book on Wattpad. I've done it. It's fun. Um, I I could self-publish. Um, I could do it on Substack, serialize it. I don't know. There's a million ways to get your stories out there. And let's say no one wants it still and I can't pay my bills. You know what? I'll go get a job at the grocery store. I'm still alive at the end of this. Um, and my which, family- Which means a lot to you because you came I have, close. I, have, I, ha I am closer than you all can possibly fathom how close I was to death. And um, which you can read about on my in my newsletter on Substack. You can access it. Um, that's a free post. Uh, and I want to say something about baking too, um, yeah, because yeah. I love to bake. And one of the reasons I love to bake is because baking is precision. So when I bake, I follow a recipe and having to follow the recipe, quarter teaspoon salt, half teaspoon baking soda, it, re, it forces my thoughts off the cycle right off that neural pathway and it forces me to go 
half a cup flour. Oh, I've got to count. I'm using a half a cup to get two cups of flour. I've got to count one, two, three. And then I literally pull my thoughts away and it breaks the cycle. So sometimes it's a matter of figuring out what you can do, an activity you can do that breaks the cycle. Yeah, it's really helpful. I I run. I started running two years ago, and that has really been good for my OCD and my dark, my intrusive thoughts. I mean, I would almost say like right now, I have managed it. I don't have an issue with that because I have worked so hard <laughs> um, to deal to 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 do this behavioral therapy and learn how to. You're not stopping the thoughts. You're letting them go and seeing where they take you. Um, and it it really sort of forms new neural pathways that don't end yeah. up. Where- they were or in your case with the baking or me with running like it we're going on to this neural pathway for a while I'm going to listen to my music and get fixated on my running watch am I am I hitting my pace that's right I mean I I'm I'm a I'm a long time outrigger canoe yep. paddler I know and I tell you I it, I joke about this but of course it's also not a joke that's my medication I, 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 I can I can be in the worst mood and it's not for everybody right exercise isn't for everybody but for the people who it works for I can go in the worst mood and have a hard practice and, or I'll have a race, you know, we had a race yesterday and then I'm I'm like, hi, right. For hours afterwards, it just clears it out. It's like, I can do anything now. We had a seven mile practice and I was really tired and it doesn't matter that, you know, whatever. And and so you gotta, yeah. Find what does that for you. Kate has the strongest shoulders guys. Kate has the strongest shoulders I have ever felt in my lifetime. I remember touching you at an event and I was like, oh, oh yeah. I remember that. <laughs> I do. I'm ripped, man. I got my. I was so better. impressed. Okay. Eric says my first, oh, my first publisher pulled my first novel due to dismal sales. And I felt like a failure. You have all my empathy, Eric. I realize I'm not, but that's the business. My question is, what are some tips writers can take to recharge and put things into perspective after a crushing rejection? And and I'll just, you know, the story I told about writing something completely different, that there was no, was for me one of the steps I took. Yeah. I just completely did something that it was almost, it was almost the nature, the fact that it was almost something I shouldn't be doing that helped with that. Yeah, right? it's like I'm I'm flouting you're authority. Cheating. You're cheating. I shouldn't be doing this. It's a forbidden thing, but I'm going to do it anyway. And that helped me get maybe that helped me in a way feel like I could recover some of my own agency as opposed to being at the mercy of terrible things or uh, upsetting things, whatever they might be. Now I had made a choice to do something that probably I shouldn't have done, but it was great. But you should have. I mean, I I, but I, I should. Have. I should have I'm done. a strong believer that no words are ever wasted, even if you like. I yeah. still write fan fiction. I can't sell that, but it brings me such joy to like write something yeah. completely, no pressure, solely for me. It's amazing. It feels good. And like this book, The Luminaries, I never finished my story. I gave myself shingles and took time off and just put that book away and wrote something that was not under contract so and the same the same yeah it, this book we're was, twins so yeah. we're twins we've always and been it, twins it pure id mm-hmm. it's all the things yes. i love most crammed into one yes. book that i was yes. like i don't care yes. if no one reads this it's a cw show in a book i don't care if no one picks it up because i was- loved writing it it was, I did the same thing. I said, I'm just going to put whatever I want in here. Ooh, sexy haunt. That's my favorite you know? trope. Like, That's my favorite That's trope. In, enemies to friends to lovers. Yep. Got some of that. Makeover scene. Yep. We're going to find a place for that. I, anything, anything you love yeah. most, like just shove it in. And, and I, it is freeing. And it like showed me that like, oh yeah, you do know what you're doing. It, the witchlands might be hard and you might need a break from it, given that it's also all wrapped up in my trauma right now. But you do know how to write books, clearly, and you can enjoy them. And even if you don't sell them, like I had so much fun, I had so much fun writing that book. Um, and um, obviously, uh, I did succeed. So, yay! Yeah, and and so I think that sense that we're agreeing here that find the place where you can find joy in. I mean, why write? Right? Why do we write? I I mean, who knows? Because when you said that that the you're the most soothed when you're writing. I feel the same, right? I'm the most me when I'm writing. And so find that place. But and but also, 
remember that it's one thing. This is one, and it is hard. Accept that it's painful or, or just em embrace that it's painful. Find the, like sometimes I visualize the, the pain or the disappointment I'm feeling as a part of me who I can like hug and say, oh my God, that really sucked, right? Pat, pat my own back, meet myself and, and say, you know, I love you, right? I love you. And I know this was terrible. And, it, and, and now we're going to go on. Yeah. I um, mean, I, I would also suggest too to Eric, um, if you, it's okay to take time off. Like it's okay to, if you, yeah. if you're feeling yeah. recharged yet, like it is okay to be like, all right, I'm going to go like binge a bunch of it. That's my go-to binge a bunch of video games and some TV shows when my toddler's sleeping. Uh, I am rewatching the expanse TV show right now. Like I so good. I, so good. So good. And I was like, oh yeah, this show like inspired me so much when I was writing my book, Blood Witch. And I'm like getting really excited again. Like, ah, yeah, that, that I'm going to use yeah. all these cool things that I like in yeah. the last Witchlands book that I'm still working on right now and think is terrible. But I'm like, no, take this. This isn't, I'm amped up. I'm amped up by good story. Um, I love gaming. So like I game a little too much, but I get really into it and it helps me get excited about my own work. But I also have learned to give myself patience and space if I am not feeling the words like my life totally imploded about a month and a half ago and I could feel the wall come up on mm. my words and I was like you know what I have learned by now after everything I've been through that this means time to stop it's fine I will write like 25 newsletters right now it's how I will fill my my work hours for the next month um I will write something else I'm trying to do it don't tell my editor um I'm just going to work on things that bring me joy for a bit that are not those words um because that's what I need to do until I do feel more soothed again, more recharged. Uh, so it's okay to not, it's okay if, I understand if you want to, because you are the most Eric when you're working. Um, but I also want you to, to be patient with Eric if he, if he can't find the words right now. I think that's what we all want. We want to find the words and we want to feel like our words are worth writing and they are. I mean, they are. They are. Because no one else can write the words we write. It's just how, it's just, that's what makes art. Um, so we are at the end of the hour. Thank you. This was fabulous. Yeah, and thank you. It was super fun. I knew we would have fun. I know, I know. Um, it was great. Um, I went a little past my comfort zone, but oh, well, I'm just, I knew, I knew something would happen. Um, I can't my fault I have that effect I know you have that effect on people. um so for those of you who are here for the nebula platform the writing thing oh well, I can't the flight crew writing thing is here and Sasha Stronach is going to be hosting the writing cafe I can't remember what it's called I feel so embarrassed <laughs> I I should know after three years but I don't um so that's next for those of you who are joining us on YouTube when this is put up there. Thank you for listening all the way through. And for anyone else, the next one is National Book Award winner Melinda Lowe, who's going to next month, April, with April, um, who, and we're going to be talking about when lightning strikes, Ooh. which is like a good balance with this, right? Yes. Yeah. Um, thank you again. Thank you, Susan, Denner, Susan, for coming up. But thank you to Nathan Lucas and to Sipwa and the Nebula Conference platform for um, yes. for making this happen. Yeah. And we're going to have like a two minute silence, two minute, <laughs> two seconds. Oh, my God, I can't think anymore. OK, thank you. Thank you all. Thank you for listening.